might decide where we ought to go. Uh, in that connection, uh, I'd like to ask uh, that the uh, first presentation uh, be given by Archbishop Thomas Murphy, who has doubtly had many of his flock on both sides or all sides of these issues. Uh, Archbishop, would you begin? Thank you. President Clinton, Vice President Gore, members of the cabinet, and fellow participants in the Forest Conference, my ministry as Archbishop of Seattle brings me to nearly 200 parishes in Catholic communities, from the Canadian border to the Columbia River, from the crest of the Cascade Mountains to the shores of the Pacific. I often drive down Highway 101 from our parish of St. Anne's in the Olympic Peninsula town of Forks to Our Lady of Good Help, our parish in the Grays Harbor town of Hoquiam. En route, I pass through the magnificent moss-covered old-growth forest of the Olympic National Park, pristine forest virtually untouched by human hands. I also pass through private and public lands that have been logged and logged again. And some of these lands have been replanted, and a uniform group of Douglas firs awaits some future harvest. Other lands are clear-cut and fallow, all but devoid of the abundant forest life for which God has graced creation. At the end of my drive, I arrive in Hokium, a proud, independent town that carries on despite the recent closure of the mill that was its biggest employer. Here I meet a burly, strapping fellow in the prime of life. He has worked most of the 40-some years in the woods felling trees. He has been without work for months stretching into years. He has lost his home and his ties to family and friends are tenuous. Archbishop, he asks me, do you know what it's like to work for 20 years and then end up sleeping in your pickup at the side of the road? I tell him honestly, I do not. But I do know that this man's tragedy has been repeated thousands of times by workers who have lost their livelihoods in our forest. These are not only personal experiences, they are community tragedies. The man who lives in his pickup truck has lost the wherewithal and the self-worth that builds community. He does not vote. He does not belong to the Rotary Club or Kiwanis. He doesn't show up for coffee at the diner or McDonald's. <laughs> the loss of that man and those like him is evident in the empty storefronts in downtown Hoquiam and other timber communities. The loss is evident in the lines of the soup kitchens and the welfare office. And the loss is evident in the homes where unemployed workers, anxious, depressed, sunk in despair, lash out at their loved ones or find solace in alcohol or drugs. A culture, a way of life, prized in reverence in our timber communities is dying. I speak today as a representative of a Judeo-Christian tradition that values all of God's creation, the forest, the workers, the workers who labor in the forest and the communities whose livelihood has been dependent on the forest. In the creation account, the Bible tells us God looked at everything that was made and found it very good, and it is. Mr. President, I commend you for convening this conference. I believe that only through dialogue and full participation of all concerned parties can we achieve a balanced solution that serves the common good. The role of the church is to raise the moral values involved in preserving forests, employing forest workers, and saving forest-dependent communities. Our hope is that common ground will be discovered so that the common good will be achieved. The timber crisis is a moral issue. I, the members of my church, and the members of many other churches, stand ready to assist your efforts towards resolution and reconciliation. Thank you for listening today. May the blessings of a good and gracious God be with all of us and grant us the wisdom to find solutions.